of us in the room through Wright State. So, please welcome Abby Edwards and her dog, Kathy, with a K, to the stage. Everybody, we're half we're more than halfway through. How are we feeling? You still excited to be here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm still excited to be here because my name, as Sam very eloquently said, is Abby Edwards, and I am here today to share with you the impact that self-advocacy can have on your life. Now, when most people think of self-advocacy, they think that it's just a way to get something done. When I thought of self-advocacy, I envisioned something dramatic, like a petition, like someone in Washington. I didn't know that self-advocacy could be as simple as sending an email. It wasn't until I was asked to speak about it that I realized what self-advocacy really is, a choice to take control of your life. Now that's all well and good. If it's so simple, why haven't we all done it? Maybe it's because we don't feel like it's our choice to make. We live in a world that is constantly changing. New technology and trends come out all the time and it can give us the impression that we don't really have a say in what goes on in the world around us. I can personally relate to feeling out of control. Around four and a half years ago, I was at a point in my life where I felt like I had no say over what happened to me. At this point, I had just lost the remainder of my vision, had just had major back surgery, and was going through a second round of IV treatments for osteoporosis. This was a time in my life where I felt like everything had been taken out of my hands. Just before my freshman year of high school, I started exploring the role that technology could have in my life. I began to utilize things like email to communicate with my teachers and to complete assignments. At some point that year, I became aware of all the opportunities that had been opened up to me, and I made the choice to embrace all that life had to offer. With renewed confidence, I communicated with the mission staff at Wright State, and then, my sophomore year, with my first ever college professors. As my confidence continued to grow, I decided to apply for a guide dog. I was approved by Guiding Eyes for the Blind and spent a life-changing summer training with my guide dog, Kathy, in New York. I got more than just a dog that summer, though. I got even more confidence because now I was able to not just talk confidently, but also to walk confidently. I carried this confidence into my junior year, and when I was having trouble in one of my psychology classes at Wright State, I was able to confidently speak with the dean of the department to resolve my problem. Everyone around me noticed how confident I felt, so my school district nominated me for a National Self-Advocacy Award. As a result of receiving this award, I was able to be a guest on a radio show, a local newscast, and had several opportunities to speak for different civic groups. Last summer, as a result of advocating for myself, I attended an independent living program that taught me invaluable skills like cooking, cleaning, things that will last me a lifetime. Looking back, I realized that it was my choice to take control of my life those four and a half years ago that has led me to where I am today. Now thus far, you've been sitting back listening to my story thinking, gosh, this is nice, I don't have to do anything. So this is where I would like to extend a challenge to everyone here today to come up with at least one thing that you would like to see change in your life. Ask yourself, what can I do to accomplish this? Then realize that you have the power to make that goal a reality. You will find out, as I once did, that once you start advocating for yourself, it gets easier and easier to accomplish bigger and bigger goals. 
Consider the impact that simply deciding to take control of your life could have on you and those around you. And don't just think of self-advocacy as a way to get things done. Think of it as a state of mind, one that will take you as far as you can imagine. Thank you. Well, that was pretty good, I gotta say. All right, so self-advocacy, the client is learning to make decisions and choices that affect their lives so that they're able to be more independent. TBS specialists may need to teach clients about their rights. Along with learning about their rights, they also learn about responsibilities. All right, so since there's only a few of us, um, we're just gonna have, spend a few minutes and have a discussion about what we think the difference between advocacy, what we see as the difference between advocacy and self-advocacy, and how have you taught your client in the past to self-advocate? All right, my Desiree, go ahead. It's funny because this actually happened today. You know, I, I preach self-advocacy a lot to all of my clients. And today, one of my clients came to me and told me she found lumps in her breast. And I asked her, I said, well, have you told staff that yet? And she said, no. I said, well, I really think we need to go let the Don know what's going on. And she, so she and I walked into the director of nursing's office and I told her, I said, okay, now you need to tell her. And my client looked at her and she said, I'm here because she's made me be here. But <laughs> I had I said, I had breast cancer before wow. and they took half of my left breast and now I feel two lumps in it. Wow. And the Don said, well, yeah, you can't let that go. I'm, the doctor's going to be here today and we're going to have them see you and order some tests. Good. So I actually, and then a little later, she said, I really want one of those walkers with a seat. And so we then went and I had her tell the physical therapy office that she needed a walker. So I actually had her self-advocate twice for herself today. That's awesome. Good deal. All right. Who's next? Who wants to go next? And you don't even have to answer both. If you want to just talk about the difference between advocacy and self for you or how you've taught your client a way to self-advocate, either or or both. Jordan, did you have your hand up? Yes. <laughs> um, I it, It's funny because in my also it happens today. Um, during an ISP meeting, I did have a client. Um, he usually doesn't have an issue with self-advocating for himself, but I started to pick up um, on the fact, like, you know, when we were asking him, like, questions about things that he wanted to do, it seemed that he was starting to um, get overwhelmed. And I want to say it could have been because he's, I want to say he's not used to speaking up for himself, like, as much as um, you would do, like, in an ISP meeting. So I want to yeah. say he was getting overwhelmed as far as, like, how can I put this into words? My word placement is all over everywhere okay. today. That, that's um, in the air today, just FYI. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want to say he he was just getting frustrated because he thinks like as soon as he says something, someone is going to judge him for it. So oh. with him, what I try to do is we do work on stuff advocacy in our sessions and I just do like the constant reassurance, and we also do role play as well. Nice. Nice. Good. Good example. Thank you for sharing. Who we got next? Go ahead, Rebecca. So I've, I've been working with a client for the last several weeks. She is um, the type of person who she says everybody's out to get her. She can't talk to staff. She's uncomfortable talking to staff. She thinks that if she says anything to them, it's going to put more of a target on her back. So the last several weeks we've been working towards the self-advocacy. I have advocated for her where I went and asked a staff member, um, like, for example, she was curious about an appointment that she was supposed to go to. She didn't want to go talk to them. 
So I went to the staff member and found out about the appointment for her and relayed it to her. And now the last couple of weeks, I have been actually taking her to staff members and facilitating conversation to gain that comfortability level that she needs to be able to feel like she's comfortable speaking to these people. They are, when I'm not there, they are one of her biggest advocates. So I'm trying to get her to see that. Yeah. But she's, she's doing a lot better now. She is, there are certain staff members that she will talk to, whereas there's still certain staff members she won't. Yeah. And that's, I found that like, regardless of the type of facility, I have found that clients will always have a preferred person, like a favorite person, whatever the shift. They've got one on each shift that they just tend to gravitate to first before they move on. So it's nice that they have that. It's crazy that they advocate for if you're not around. Well, some good work. All right, who else we got? One, two, three. Yeah, Jessica. Um, I've used it with a lot of my clients who are very uh, like prompt dependent, um, like for problem solving, like their call buttons and things like that to actually speak up for what they need instead of, you know, just keeping it. And then I also have somebody who's very active in the facility who um, I've sat in on a lot of meetings with them in administration and she's very active in advocating for herself and concerns <laughs> and things to that extent. Well, that's great. Thank you. All right. Who do we got left? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. So mine happened like a couple of weeks ago because I have a client who used to eat in her room. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to like um, change that so she can eat in the dining room. But like she always tell me but she, I think she didn't have the courage or she was like a little reserved. She doesn't want to speak up herself. Yeah. What I did was, I'm sorry. What I did was I told her, okay, you know what you can do? You can talk to the nutritionist and see what they can do for you. Maybe they can allow you to eat in the dining room. And it happened. She spoke up for herself and now she is in the dining room, you know, nice. and rushing people out. <laughs> <laughs> but that's nice. So at least she saw the effect of speaking up for herself, right? Like she saw the positive that comes from us. That's great. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. All right, who do we got? Maybe one or two of you left. Kayla, go ahead. So I advocate for clients a lot and I try to get them to do it for themselves, but I have one um, and she is often fearful of other people. She has mm. a lot of issues with her past where she's scared that people are going to verbally attack her. Oh. Um, so yesterday she came up to me and she showed me she had a rash under her breast. It just looked like some, you know, yeast where she hadn't been washing properly so and she was she said she had told the nurse but she also has a lot of confusion and she said she told the nurse the night before I was like that doesn't sound right so I took her with me and I said let's go and she ended up showing her um, and they ended up also figuring out that she's not properly advocating for herself for shower as well so I kind of showed her and told her and explained to her, you know, if you need help, make sure you tell them you need help yeah. uh, and explain to her, you know, the CAs are here to help you because she gets confused about that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Well, that's a good example. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have one more? Or was that everybody? All right. Well, if, if I missed you, I apologize. <laughs> I got everybody. But I'll catch back up if I did miss somebody. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Well, good job. Those are good examples, guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. So what are some characteristics required for self-advocacy? Um, an awareness of the client's personal preferences, their interests, strengths, and limitations. The ability to differentiate. They should be able to tell the difference between wants and needs. We the ability to make choices based on their preferences, their interests and wants and needs, the ability to consider multiple options and to anticipate consequences for their decisions, right? Just the natural consequences in the world. 
and the ability to initiate and take action when needed. So this is actually, we prefer to hand out that first handout, 7.1. Um, I've got that pulled. Oh, I had it pulled up. Hang on a second. There it is. All right, so this is that first handout I sent you, teaching self-advocacy skills to your clients. So it goes through some of the characteristics they're required, but the next couple of slides, we're going to um, talk about those. All right. So the client should have the ability to evaluate decisions based on the outcomes of previous decisions and to revise any future decisions accordingly. Um, the ability to set and work towards goals, problem solving skills, striving for independence while recognizing interdependent interdependence with others the ability to self-regulate behavior, and self-evaluation skills. So as you can see, self-advocacy is an advanced skill. It is also an active skill. Allowing another to advocate on one's behalf is more passive, but it still requires the client to communicate needs and preferences in order to be advocated by another. All right. Independent performance and adjustment skills. And again, these are more characteristics required for self-advocacy. Persistence, the ability to use communication skills such as negotiation, compromise, and persuasion to reach goals. The ability to assume responsibility for actions and decisions. Self-confidence and creativity such as creating other accommodations that help support the need of the students. These characteristics may need to be worked on and mastered as a client is learning to self-advocate and developing their self-advocacy skills with the support and guidance of the TBS specialist. So developing, oops, I went backwards. There we go. Developing self-understanding will help your client plan a realistic goal for themselves. You support clients to reflect on their unique situations to develop self-awareness. So clients who understand themselves, their needs, and their rights are better able to, to self-advocate to get those needs met, engage in successful self-advocacy with the outcome that they desire. And then they need to communicate those needs, inquire about their rights, or research options that are available to them. Clients who gain and develop a greater understanding of their own needs gain the confidence to recognize their abilities. So to self-advocate, clients need to recognize, accept, and understand their needs and abilities first. So as you're supporting your client to identify their needs, remember to also identify strengths and abilities that they can draw upon as they engage in self-advocacy. This tells you and the client more about how they will self-advocate. So you can kind of see from the graphic how everything sort of ties together. It all goes back and forth. So some strategies for self-advocacy, so how to problem solve. Self-advocacy is not about having all the answers. An effective self-advocate is one who asks the right questions and engages in creative problem solving. So clients may need to learn problem solving skills as part of learning self-advocacy skills. So your client can build self-advocacy strategies around asking what, who, when, where, and how when problem solving and self-advocating. Excuse me. The who, what, when, where, and how to problem solve and self-advocate are going to be outlined in the next few slides. So the what. What does the client need to know or receive from others to accomplish their goal? Setting specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-related, smart objectives is a good way to plan steps to meet the long-term goals. Setting effective goals not only increases motivation, but allows measuring the progress achieved and it helps align focus and behavior. Make sure you're able to name and describe a client's question or, so, or situation clearly. Be clear in your own mind about what a good solution would be. So supporting your client to get specific about defining what they're hoping to accomplish, what questions they need answered, or what outcome they desire by self-advocating. So who? Who is most likely to have what a client needs? and to have the power, knowledge, or ability to provide it for the client. Take time to find out who is most likely, who is most knowledgeable and helpful when it comes to your client needs. 
This could be you as a TBS specialist. You may hold the key piece to knowing your client's needs and how they can physically and emotionally meet those needs. Others might be therapists, nurses, physicians, program managers, who else is on their treatment team? Or do they maybe need a referral to another provider? So once your client gets specific about what they're trying to accomplish with their self-advocacy, brainstorm with them for any and all potential sources of support and, and information. The client may need TBS specialist guidance to then go to the right person or people. Um, we can say they're barking up the right tree. For example, the dietary aid may be a good listener to a client complaining of side effects. However, the dietary aid cannot prescribe a new medication for your client. When is the most effective and appropriate to raise an issue? Encourage your client to approach people when they are able to give their full attention rather than when they are multitasking or interacting with someone else. Support your client to ask for what they want and ask whether the person has time to deal with it now or would they prefer to do so later. Most people appreciate being given a choice. Brainstorm with your client situations like when is it acceptable to interrupt someone or when is it better to wait? When is it acceptable to draw attention to your feelings and opinions? And when is it considered impolite or disruptive? So timing is everything. Just as you're supporting your client to think about the best time to approach others, also think about what makes good timing for your client. Think about, is your client a morning person or a night owl? Does your client need to have their coffee, a meal, or a nap to think clearly and communicate best? The where. So when your client is self-advocating, it's usually best to choose a place where they'll feel, more comf where they'll feel comfortable. What issues should be raised around peers? Should a subject be discussed in private or should it be discussed in public? For example, your client may not want to have a long talk while standing in a busy hallway or a crowded common area, but they might want privacy and would prefer to speak in your office or an activity room. Set your client up for success by planning ahead in a comfortable, neutral place to self-advocate. Perhaps reserving the space is something you as a TBS specialist can coordinate and arrange. How does a client typically express themselves in both stressful and comfortable situations? So when advocating for themselves, how much detail and background should your client give when they interact with others? Role play this with them. This is where you can teach or model for your client how much information is appropriate to share with someone. So planning ahead and encouraging clients to communicate in the way that they are most comfortable for example, a client may be too anxious to speak with their landlord over the phone or in person about something needing repair. Could they email or text the landlord instead to self-advocate and get their needs met? If they need to make a phone call, consider making a script of what to say to the landlord or create a list of questions ahead of time to help reduce their anxiety. Another self-advocacy skill are I statements. All right, so this is gonna refer to handout 7.2 to learn the skill of using I statements to self-advocate. Okay, so referring back to that, oops, seven two. Okay, so the I statements, this is that handout. You don't have it pulled up. Oh, wrong button, sorry. Your clients may self-advocate through the use of I statements. I statements are a style of communication that focuses on the feelings or beliefs of the speaker rather than the thoughts and characteristics that the speaker attributes to the listener. So the basic formula for an I statement, again, and this is going to refer back to a handout 7.2. Oh, I feel you want to have an emotion here when there's your situations. So, oops, there are variations on the I statement. So more complicated ones may be used once the basic I feel when has been mastered. So again, referring back to that handout, oops, excuse me. Um, so the basic formula again is, I feel happy when my grandkids visit. Or we can, sometimes I feel happy because, and then what's the rationale for emotion? We can add something here. Somebody give me something because I just brain locked. <laughs> Somebody take the second one. Sometimes I feel what? Oops. 
And they want to volunteer. I think I'll, all right. Uh, let's see. Can you repeat that question, please? Yeah, I it's just that job. second. That's okay. Sometimes, or right, you put, I feel blank when, because, whoops, let me skip that. Because, why? It's just you're adding a rationale for the emotion. Okay. So, like the basic formula is, I feel, I just said, I feel happy when grandkids visit. So, maybe we could add, I feel what? You could say, I feel happy when my grandkids visit because I don't get to see them very often. <laughs> That'll work. Or sometimes after, I feel when can be communicated once the clients master the basic ice cream. So well, let me skip up here. Hmm. All right. So I statements will enable clients to be assertive without making accusations, which can often make the listener feel defensive. I statements can help foster positive communication in relationships and may help clients become stronger as sharing feelings and thoughts in an honest and open manner can help grow closer on an emotional level. An I statement naturally causes the speaker to take responsibility for their own thoughts and feelings rather than attributing them, sometimes falsely or unfairly, to someone else. So I statements are a neutral way for uh, communicating one's thoughts and feelings as one is engaging in self-advocacy, as clients are only speaking for themselves and their unique perspective or experience. All right, so forming I statements and handout 7.3. So we'll use this handout talking about our I statements. So I have that up. All right. So I feel, and we're telling the person how we feel. Right. I'll skip ahead. I'm sorry. I'm getting way click happy over here. <laughs> so I feel when you, because. And then it's telling the person what we want to do now. So we're telling the person how we feel. Then we want to tell the person what they did to make you feel that way. So I feel happy when you smile. And then tell the person why you feel that way. Because you look happy. So then we're telling the person what they want them to do now. Please smile more. I know that's a very lame one. <laughs> All right, so this is, hand, we're going to be going handout 7.4 now. And once a client has, once the concept has been taught to a client and understood with handout 7.3, practice, practice, practice with the client by using handout 7.4. All right, so I'm going to ask for three volunteers and we're going to create I statements using the scenarios up on the screen. The, when a person feels that they're being blamed, the I statements are simple. Oh, sorry, the examples are right here. Good Lord, Stacy. I actually used this when I did my groups, this very exact same one. Nice. That's great. So you're going to be one of my volunteers? I'm always <laughs> willing to volunteer. I know you are. Bless your heart. So you just tell me when. Okay, I sure will. All right. Do I get? Can I get two more volunteers? You know, it's a team effort. All right, Desiree, who else we got? Let me see here. Um, Jordan and Jessica. Here. All right. So our good, whoops, I just blocked everything off myself. Sorry. All right, so hold on. So let's create, so, oh, let me get you to the screen you need. That might help a little better. I'm like, what is this talking about? Okay, so let's build some I statements out of here, okay? Um, Desiree, you want to take the first one? Sure. I feel upset when I come home and the house is messy because I've worked all day and don't want to have to deal with that mess. <laughs> Amen. I think you just hit every lady in the room. <laughs> All right, Jordan, you want to take the next one? Yes. Um, I 
feel annoyed when my feelings aren't heard or acknowledged because it doesn't feel as if I have a say so. Nice. Good job. And then uh, Jessica? Uh, I feel worried when I don't hear from you after several hours because I care about you. Nice. And then we'll say... I felt lonely when you did not come and have dinner with me all week because I had to eat by myself with the cat or the dog. All right. So now um, we're, I want to do this in the chat, but I want everybody to practice um, an I statement. Just everybody type one in the chat, if you would, please. And we'll just take a couple of minutes for that. Oh, that's nice, Rebecca. <laughs> oh. You guys are coming up with good ones. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Dog cuddles. There's nothing. The only thing better is grandbaby cuddles. <laughs> yeah, one, two, three, four. Okay, who else do you still need? Okay. All right. Still waiting on a couple. <laughs> Is there room for you in the bed? <laughs> oh, goodness. That's funny. I can't say much. I had four at one time, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> of course, mine were all different sizes, too. <laughs> All right, who else we got here? Nice. Thank you, Jordan. Nice, Jessica. So one, two. Uh, I feel like I'm missing somebody. All right, guys, did everybody get one in? There's seven of us. Oh. All right. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you. Good job. All right. On. Okay, so checking. Oops. We're going to check in with clients on how this new way of communicating may be empowering them and changing how others react to them as they self advocate. You want to continue to practice I statements with your clients over time to ensure success with self advocacy. All right, so handout 7.5. Clients may need specific support in advocating for themselves with their doctors. So we've got um, an example of preparing for a doctor visit. Self-advocacy is an element of healthcare that concerns sharing, expressing, and highlighting the rights and desires of a client. It often includes ensuring clients have the right to make decisions about their own health. The relationship your clients have with their doctor or psychiatrist is important in the recovery journey because together they can find medication and treatment options that reflect and what, excuse me, reflect what they want to need, what they want and need 
work for them and support their plans and goals. So this handout should be done and worked through prior to an actual appointment for your client. Um, do some modeling or role play and working through this handout before the appointment to help the client feel prepared to self-advocate about their health and, their, and to reduce any anxiety they might feel about it. So just some of the questions I'd ask is think about what is important to you. Again, this is from your client. What is important to me in my life? What are my goals? How can medications or supportive treatments help get me, help me get or keep these things? Do medications or supportive treatments ever get in the way of things in my life? And if so, how? You know, and it's just having that discussion with your client and helping them find the answers to these. Right, so when your client asks questions, it helps their doctor understand their concerns. The doctor can then explain whether their concerns are plausible. Their answers can help ease your client's anxiety, even if the answer is not one they were hoping for. So you can brainstorm with your client possible concerns to bring up at their next doctor's appointment, at their next doctor appointment. Also ask if there have been any items that they were too anxious to bring up during past appointments. Often fear of the unknown is worse than knowing the truth and anxiety prevents clients from asking questions about their own health and mental health. So think about what you want to discuss with your doctor, letting your doctor know about changes in any symptoms, mood or behaviors you may be experiencing, or any questions or concerns you may have. And it's just like, I want to discuss A, B, C, D, help them figure out those details. Support your client to let their doctor know about any changes in symptoms, mood, or behaviors that they may be experiencing or any questions or concerns the client may have. This models advocacy and allows your client to be able to express how they have been feeling and independently be able to tell the doctor if they have been feeling better, the same, or worse. TBS specialists may remind the client of any side effects that they've been experiencing, any medication questions they may have had, Maybe the client's mentioned something to you during sessions, which would be better addressed by their doctor. You know, you can remind them of that. Um, you want to defer to the prescribing professional when it comes to trying any new medications, starting or stopping medications, or anything medical related. TBS specialists are qualified to assist clients in monitoring side effects and symptoms, and then support clients to communicate this information to the prescriber. So this is just how I've been feeling since my last appointment, the better, same, or worse, and then explain you know, what it is, any new symptoms. It's just being able to give the doctor those details. Going to an appointment with a list of questions to ask or hand the doctor can help clients make the most of limited time with the doctor. These questions can help clients begin conversations about issues that may be important, such as their overall wellness, their medications, or any supportive treatments. So just some of the things about my overall wellness. What can I do to help improve my overall health? Or how much exercise should I do? What are other ways I can stay healthy? How can I better manage my stress? Mental health medications. How can medication help me reach my goals? Or what are the side effects? How long will it take to start working? To start working? And about supportive treatments. Some of the examples are what can I do to get supportive housing? What is psychotherapy? How can it help me? Can you tell me more about peer support? Or what does a case manager do to support my recovery journey? And then you've also got the selection for other if there's something on their mind or something they want to know about that's not listed here. It's got a pretty good variety, though. Okay, so now we're going to use the example of Marty throughout documentation on the next few slides. All right, so Marty is your 55-year-old male client in a long-term care facility. Marty is dealing with several health conditions, such as multiple sclerosis and lupus in addition to class three obesity. He has very limited mobility and often refuses to get out of bed or to use his wheelchair. Prior to experiencing his health concerns and in his younger days, Marty and his wife owned and operated several small grocery stores. Marty is a widower and has a diagnosis of depression and struggles with suicidal ideations. Staff at the LTC re facility report that Marty has been difficult to work with. Specifically, that Marty makes rude comments to the female staff, and he is uncooperative with hygiene. When this TBS specialist brought this up to Marty, he broke down crying, stating that some of the female staff remind him of his wife who passed away eight years ago. Marty shared he does not know how to deal with this and just wants to be with his wife again. She knew how to take care of me. Marty does not have children. He has a brother and sister who are some support to him, but their relationships are somewhat strained. 
Marty is grieving the loss of his beloved cat and dog, which he had to surrender to an animal shelter when he came to long-term care. Gosh, poor Marty. All right, so his goal, I want my old life back and to be happy again. Marty will improve his mood and increase positive social interactions with others. His first objective, Marty will reduce suicidal thoughts from three times per day to one time per day for self-report and clinical observation. Objective number two, Marty will engage in and increase social activity outside of his room as evidenced by participating in two activities per week for self-report and clinical observation. So what are some advocacy or self-advocacy activities that you might engage Marty in to support him to work towards these goals and objectives? Um, if I could get three of you, please. Let's see, where's everybody at? Um, all right, Cad, can I get one from you? Did somebody raise their hand? I did. Okay, go ahead. Um, I was gonna say for the objective to maybe have him engage in like activities, like any activities that's outside as far as the like the group activities that they have at the long term care. Yeah. And like why would you why would you um encourage that? What about that would be do you think would be beneficial to him? Just him being amongst other peers and just also giving him that chance to develop his social skills okay. and the tolerance of being around different people and different personalities. Yeah. Nice. That's great. Thank you. Desiree? I think I would suggest that he speak to somebody about maybe some pet therapy so that he could have interactions with animals since he's missing his animals so badly. Great idea. Very good idea. All right. Anybody else want to volunteer before I pick on poor cat again? I don't have very many of you, so y'all are going to get picked on at least maybe once or twice today. Anybody else got a thought? All right. Cad, you got one? Um, I think like start going to the dining room at least like trying to eat um one one meal there yeah. you know watch tv and then maybe she can be able to interact with others yeah it's a start right <laughs> gotta start somewhere yeah thank you good job guys very good all right so getting into our progress note so the intervention we're providing this week is advocacy, and we are developing and practicing self-advocacy skills. So problem-solving skills, role modeling, demonstrating what it is we're we're looking at. Excuse me, looking for Stacy. So if an activity if an activity falls under advocacy, but it is not listed under the intervention of advocacy. Um, just make sure that you're mentioning the activity by name in your client response on your note. Okay, If it's not here for you to select it under one of these, just make sure that you're giving yourself credit and the client credit for it, for what you actually did. All right, so our client response. Let's get this over to the big one so you can see it better. All right, Marty verbalized an understanding on why it's important to advocate for himself. Marty stated, they remind me of my wife and they can't take care of me like she did. So can somebody give me, um, let's see, we're running low on time. So if I can get one suggestion or feedback on what would make this client response better to show medical necessity. Can they give me one thing? What's something that's missing? All right, so we need to have our client quotes. Maybe we want to reference the goal or objective being worked on. Um, Diagnosis. Our symptoms. I'm sorry, go ahead. Diagnosis. Diagnosis, yep. There's no mention of diagnosis or symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. um, the self-advocacy, it's not necessarily mentioned. Well, advocate for myself, I guess it kind of is. Um, the specific activity the client engaged in and any progress that he may have made. So are we seeing any any of that? 
and we can link improvement in our client's symptoms with participating in coping or other skills. And then what did you as TBS, what TBS, sorry, um, supports are needed to continue progress towards improving functioning, decreasing symptoms. So what are ways that you guys can help? Time to think about. All right, and then our plan and our homework. Marty will continue to work towards having a positive relationship with female staff and advocating for himself while expressing his concerns. Okay, so how might a TBS specialist explain how any barriers are gonna be overcome? And how is your client gonna accomplish this plan? Anybody? Can they give me one? How might you accomplish a barrier here? Or how might the plan take into account the client's needs and preferences? Like if he's gonna to work towards having a positive relationship with female staff, what's a way he can do that? What's he gonna to do? To be, work polite towards when he, be polite when he's talking to them. Yeah. Don't yeah. use disparaging language or remarks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then what's a way he could be practicing to advocate for himself? You know, expressing his concerns, something he's worried about. What's, what's something he can do in between for homework? He can practice using I statements. Absolutely. Absolutely. Practice using I statements. Practice advocating. Just practice advocating. You know, if nothing else, he can, maybe he can make a list of things that he wants he's concerned about. Then next time he sees you, you know, you guys can discuss this and he can help figure out a way. Is this, you know, a way to advocate for himself? You work with him like that. But basically the best plan is specific about who is doing what, when, and why. Right. All right. So then our discharge, we are always working towards discharge. So we want to plan how clients are going to advocate for themselves. Do they need uh, referrals or other services? Do they need accommodations? So, and you might need to assess their needs, you know, getting closer to discharge before going on to advocacy. So as your clients near and discharge, you'll reassess their needs again. This models for them how they may advocate for themselves. This gives an idea about what services may be appropriate for them after discharge so that they can maintain any progress that they've made towards independence. You wanna plan how your client will advocate for themselves once they're discharged and then support them to identify other advocates in their life for when you're no longer involved. You wanna document this plan in their progress notes and the discharge summaries so that all the team members are aware that there is a plan in place. You may be having the advocacy dis advocacy discussion with the client, guardian, and staff, one or all the above. Include this information on the SNAP portion of the discharge summary. And advocacy may be a strength or an ability the client can draw upon after discharge. And likewise, support with self-advocacy may be a continued need. Advocacy and self-advocacy self -advocacy can be worked on at any point in treatment, even at discharge. All right, so does anybody have any questions about advocacy or any anything? No? All right, so as usual, your quiz will be sent out. Sorry about the mix-up last week, but we got everybody's grades are posted. Um, so you're good to go there. And you guys are all doing a really good job. You really are, so keep it up. Um, if anybody has any questions, needs any help, questions, comments, concerns, just let me know. All right. Okay. Well, you guys have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.